Hello and welcome to my show, Conversation with Priya. I'm your host, Priya Mishra. Today, I would like to introduce Mr. Datu Sri Ganesh. He is the founder, chairman, and chief of executive SG Education Group, vice chairman of Malaysia Lots Association, vice president South Asia for Iveta, director of Dronology, and Penang STEM. He stated, what we don't know is as relevant as what we do know. He also said that going digital as is required to today's business landscape is more than a review of what you IT team is doing. It's far more than just digital marketing or sales. A holistic view of digital is that we are all connected freely and near instantly to people, devices, and physical objects around us. So building agility in our approach is key to navigation with landscape successfully. His contribution a focus on transformation brought about to five core areas in the new digital economy. Industrial internet for thinking like cloth, drone technology, customer experience, data analytic and business solution. His business focused on the development of life talent for the digital economy. His foundation lies in Tibet. He is working to enhance the national workforce with skill set that future proof them. He is also spreading the an initiative to create talented ranging from the drone field application to drone data services. So today, help me to welcome Mr. Dato. Hello and welcome my, to my show, Mr. Dato. How are you? A pleasure to be here and I'm fine. How's things with you? It's, it's great. Uh, it has been an honor to have you. It's been a long uh, time I wanted to reach you out. I know you guys are busy, but thank you. Uh, how is it uh, going? I would like to know how your whole SG journey started for my okay, audience. Uh, well, um, thanks for asking. Um, it, it's a very common question. So uh, I, I would, I would, every time I'm saying, I relive exactly the, 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 the entire journey. Right. It all started um, when, uh, you know, the, the, the time in the early uh, 2000 where we had um, a big IT uh, transformation taking place in Malaysia as well. Sure. But, uh, what, what has been very imminent that time is that we have consumers, technology consumers, basically uh, technology will be uh, transformed from uh, different countries to Malaysia. And yeah. then we have foreigners coming into Malaysia and basically uh, playing the uh, developer's role and so on, right? Mm -hmm. But being uh, a Malaysian, uh, we basically uh, uh, capitalize on the usage of the technology itself. Right. right. So this is when I realized that there is a gap uh, where when it comes to the academic system, uh, we have a huge gap in a way that the what you study is a big mismatch with the, the employment opportunities out there, mm -hmm. right? Um, but this is where the skills part kicks in, right? Uh, uh, whereby you need to have the uh, specific vocation skills mm -hmm. to administer or to work on, uh, uh, to perform a certain job, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it all begins with a, with a corporate company where uh, they were sending a group of their, ski, uh, their engineers to uh, overseas to obtain right. um, uh, certain skills from Taiwan uh, for, for, for a manufacturing company, in fact. Right? Then I realized that uh, I put in a proposal. Then I already started a training company then right? uh, with, yeah. a, with, a, with a vision of uh, upskilling uh, those um, Malaysian graduates towards the requirements of the industry. Right. So when I put in a proposal, I, I countered your proposal saying that if you were to send them to Taiwan, it was going to cost you a lot of money. Yeah. Right? yeah. And, uh, I would say that why not? Um, I will work out a, a training program uh, on a consultation basis where we go on phases where I can do this. I, I can train them. Yeah. Uh, I can work on a train-the-trainer uh, framework mm -hmm. as well as I will do a support services. So okay. this is where I started and it has become successful. Then from there... Uh, this is on the um, uh, skills related to computer aided design, right? Mm -hmm. From there, I realized many other sectors require uh, requires the same uh, uh, intervention as well. So, yeah. beginning, I, I begin to go into various sectors and try to understand the gap between the academics and yeah. the industry. Uh, we curated programs 
um, based on this requirement. Mm. And of course, um, the talent required to, to transcend these skills to various participants was also a big challenge. Yeah. So what we exactly did is that we transformed the industry players into trainers, right? right. And, uh, this is where uh, we develop different sectors uh, expertise uh, with the requirements of the industry and we develop uh, the, the various framework to match the skills required. Uh, this, and that has uh, excited me, excites me like every time that I do it. So uh, many people uh, were curious then uh, how we were doing this. And um, yeah. this is where uh, we, 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 then we realized that we fall, in, we fall into the TVET sector, technical, yeah. vocational education and training. Right? Yeah. What we've been doing is very similar to that. Mm. Right? Then uh, soon after that, I began to travel to many countries, try to learn via system success models and so on. And we, we have been implementing, uh, I think, uh, across uh, Malaysia, East right. and West. Yeah. Uh, we had the opportunity to travel to Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, India as well to um, to introduce this model of uh, um, skills uh, transformation that, that uh, we, we learned throughout our journey and so on. Interesting. Right. And now we have uh, basically come to a, a mature stage whereby the, the objective and the uh, the methods of that what we want to deliver is is the same, but it's just that our our challenges are bigger now, right? Yeah. Because we're catering for various sectors. Um, so whenever there is new technology in the industry, uh, we walk back, we understand the technology, we create talents for the technology, right? By understanding yeah. the gap and all that. So seriously, these people that we create, they are the most wanted in the industry, right? And uh, yeah. even during COVID and so on, these people are very robust and dynamic in terms of adapting to the uh, industry. Um, so I feel that during COVID, we found ourselves very relevant because uh, it was um, uh, very much a future-proof career and also a recession-proof uh, career yeah. as well. So, I mean, in that case, like, of course, where you see the opportunity, you actually focused on that place and it worked out very well for you. The challenge, do you, what kind of a challenges you faced during that journey? You know, what, what is like with the, you know, challenges faced in the tight, com, you know, competitive world and, you know, way forward. How do you see that? See, uh, the biggest challenge was uh, the talent itself. No, we identify the gap. We need to find talents or experts to actually to fill in the gap so right. that we can create more uh, skilled workers out there. But right. see, sometimes uh, putting forward thoughts and vision to people would be a biggest challenge because uh, if we, we are not blind in a specific vision, then all our efforts will be derailed, right? So I face biggest challenge when it comes to perception. And when we talk about technical, vocational, and education and training, the word vocational itself uh, is, is not, they don't look uh, upon this, this particular category as, as, as something uh, to be proud of, to be, to be there, you know. So I have to clear that perception saying that vocational studies is merely a vocation studies. That means you yeah. are studying based on the requirements of the job sector. So. Right. Um, getting this perception right, actually, it, it is not supposed to be my responsibility. It's supposed right. to be the government responsibility. Yeah. So then government uh, focus was not there on TVET, but uh, of, though the policymakers, they understand how to move forward with TVET, but yeah. the biggest challenge, challenges, biggest challenge that we had was with the uh, people who were driving it, right? So... Right. That took some time mm -hmm. uh, and that took a lot of resources as well, especially right. a private company trying to bring in um, a new concept or trying to make uh, people understand the best model out there uh, in terms of career and so on. That was our biggest challenge, the perception itself and right. conveying our vision to people. 
Right. So in that sense, like, um, yeah, so it's all about like once you clarify your vision and it reaches to the end user and the, also the supporting stakeholders, it, it makes your life easier, obviously. But that brings to my next question. Digitalization has become an inevitable trend in today's life, but there has also been a concern about data security and privacy. You know, so drones are seen as an in, you know, invasive technology. What are your views on this? See, um, I would say, uh, let's see this in, uh, let's segmentize this, you know. Number one, um, if you take into uh, data privacy itself, mm -hmm. right, the data concern, I think um, we have to accept that we came, we came out with various inventions, we came out with various applications out there, uh, right. which requires a lot of our data, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and due to data breach or security, and otherwise we cannot pull the plug now, yeah. right? We just have to refine it in terms of policy and so on. Right. But what we have to learn is based on our previous mistakes and uh, uh, yeah, lessons that we must understand that data privacy should be our first priority whenever we go into uh, a technology escalation or transformation. Right. When it comes to drone, the commercial players itself, uh, for, for example, the commercial players like uh, the, the companies from China when they produce drones, they attach a camera with, as, as a payload. Right? Yeah. So we all know that uh, the data stored is not only in the drone mm -hmm. because it requires network, it can be also uh, captured through other service, other means. Right. Over network and all that. But we were excited when the drones are out there, everyone trying to fly a drone and uh, use the camera to capture or, or things like that. It is not a conventional camera. It has data which can be transmitted to other places. Right. Yeah. So India, in, in this case, India took a very good measure when it comes to that, uh, whereby uh, they banned uh, drones from countries uh, which have no uh, proper data um, storage or data policies and so on. They were the one of the first to do that. And mm. also the European countries, uh, they, they don't simply allow you to fly a drone and take a picture and all that. Yeah. Unless if the company that manufactures the drone has the um, policy in place, mm. right? Whereas in Malaysia, it's a bit different. Uh, right. we, we are a nation that uh, always learning, right? So we go into the technology first, then when we find a problem, then we learn from it. So mm -hmm. as you know now, uh, I cannot say, I, I cannot tell you confidently that we don't have the data reach and all that, but I will say that we are there. We, we are almost there. We are putting policies in place and so on so that these data are not abused and whatnot. Example, if you say, you look into a Google form, yeah, yeah. Uh, Google itself is a, it's an open platform. But when you utilize it to collect information from others, right? Google doesn't stop you from collecting information from others. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the government itself would require you to put certain policy. Mm. Whether they are aligned with Google or the third party application, we're not sure. But this Google uh, servers are not in our country, you see. Right. So that, that, that doesn't mean that the, the government can just ban Google or Yahoo. It's just a matter of, we cannot live without technology. So we have to uh, probably go into it and then manage it later. Yeah, that, that's, how, that's how I see things here. Yeah, I mean, see, security, I think uh, uh, looking at the current cybersecurity threats and, you know, we people are on a, under attack. That's why GDPR concept came and uh, almost almost every country has implemented, especially a Western society has been implemented. Um, so that is for sure very much important and everybody should look into it for technology-wise. Also, I have noticed like, you know, in, as you mentioned that it is, uh, like Malaysia is opening up to the new and you're learning with the new ways of doing things. It is also, I heard that uh, Malaysia is a very early adopter as well for a lot of 
technology. So that's a very good part of it. Like recently I was watching one art uh, documentary. It was more of a something biogenetically changed uh, mosquitoes and Malaysia was one of the early adopter on that. So I've noticed it's there are a lot of new things happening in Malaysia in itself. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, our nation, uh, we um, we're given all the avenues to go into the technology uh, as early adopters and so on. But uh, the, the part that we took is basically we are a, a consumer, technology consumers. We are not there yet as successful innovators and developers, yeah. but we are there. Uh, the government is taking a lot of initiatives, a lot of yeah. successful local companies are in the, uh, playing a global role nowadays uh, to be there. But I think we can do better or we can do more. Yeah, I'm sure. So having uh, said that, in this is like, if you look at, you know, we are, we were talking about Corona, you just mentioned about it, like how it was hard and how we revived. The thing is that in education industry, I have noticed, I mean, you know, that Australia is, uh, I live in Australia and Australia is one of the biggest economic contributor is education industry. So education industry hit across the world, especially when there, there are a lot of international students comes. Education industry such as had a big hit because of the pandemic. How do you see your business growth in this coming year? Like we are still into the pandemic, if you would say that way. And Malaysia is also no bit better right now. Like it's, it's better, but it's not that better, isn't it? So how do you see your growth in that? See, um, it all depends on the vision of an education company. If the education company uh, is relying on specific materials or a third party uh, concepts, yeah. then COVID phase would have been a big challenge for them. Yeah. Right? But if the education company itself has a vision, meaning to convey or to transcend a certain skills or, or the education itself to the learners, then in that case, I think the medium is, regardless of the medium, I think they can deliver the best uh, to their participants. For example, what we did was uh, we had um, trainers across Malaysia. Yeah. So we quickly enable our online delivery platform, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Ensure that the student gets the best out from our trainers. And it also helped us to open up avenues uh, for many other outsiders to gain skills from uh, our site, from yeah. our, our company as well. But the issue was when it comes to um, skills training, we cannot really do practical training through online. Right, right. So we were finding the closest, uh, filling up the gap between how can we transcend skills to someone via online. Yeah. So basically what I notice is learning, uh, the, the, the learning process itself or the teaching process uh, is two different things, learning and teaching. Yeah. Yes, of course you can convey your uh, teaching via Zoom, Google Meet, and so on. But how many hours can you put someone uh, in front of the screen with the same uh, spirit and momentum for them to listen to you, especially kids, right? Because uh, that is something which is, was not practical. So what we did was we focused more on the learning segment. Learning segments, we have our materials, our animated, uh, skills programs and all that in the um, LMS, Learning Management System. Right. So right. the participant or the trainees were uh, learning independently and right. we come in only for, um, for, for more like tutoring and guidance, right? Yeah. And uh, we, 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 once we, we keep the, the practical sections uh, apart from the theoretical part, we don't mix them. We know that we cannot do practical part yeah. over the uh, using a camera and so on. So what we did was we covered the theoretical part. We did the simulation and 
all with all our animated content and so on. And we we organize the practical part when they, they can return to campus. When when they can come back to campus. Right, right, right. How we do it up. Yeah, I mean, it's all about, it all comes to the how much technology you can embrace, but it's still we have our limitations and uh, human connection, human availability on the, you know, on especially practical, as you said, is very important. And it comes, it becomes more important when you are doing something brand new technology like drone and AI you are working on right now. It becomes more important for people to be available and being shown then and there, it it, it easier, eases your teacher's life, isn't it? True, very much true. Um, when when you want to convey certain technology, or you want to want to um, transcend some skills to uh, your participant or trainees, I think yeah. um, you have to find the closest way for them to comprehend what you're trying to teach. Right. right? So yeah. that was a challenge, but. Uh, I think they're living, right? When there's no option, you have to find ways. Uh, that's what we have been doing. Yeah. So, like, you know, that brings to what my next question uh, towards more business oriented. Like, you know, these days, like AI and VR has been used a lot. So, so the extended focus on AI and VR and drones has increased cost for enterprises, right? So, what can be done by to achieve cost saving and maximize profit? Um, you, you are saying that there is technology in terms of uh, AR and VR and AI. And, yes, um, they're like AI and B B VR and drones. Like, you know, the, it is kind of a, it required, a lot of enterprises now require it. And it also increases the cost, you know, um, running cost. And in mandate of these AI and VR, it actually it, it creates some expenses, extra expenses. So what can be done to achieve cost saving when it comes to the AI and VR? And our, um, I would put it this way, like, is it going to be saving or is it initial investment and long-term saving? <laughs> I would say there is an initial investment and a long-term uh, yeah. saving. And during, that, that was before COVID. And during the COVID, it is going to be the survival of a business. Right. right. It's yeah. like, um, it's a necessity and you have to invest on it and it's also a competitive advantage when yeah. you're a company and you invest on something and you want to make sure that you are a player even after a couple of years or post pandemic and so on. Right. I, think I, I would I would say my take would be um, it is a good investment I would say. Yeah. Like strategic yeah. investment. Yeah. yeah. And if we think strategically and we plan for long-term goal, it is a, of course, it's like, you know, in, in finance industry, people talk about good debt, bad debt. Debt is dead, but there is a good debt and good, bad debt. Similarly, it's a good investment to, you know. Go, yeah, it's, it's see, for, for example, I'm saying, see, anything that you, you do, right, nowadays, yeah. using the AR or AI and Many terms out there, you know, many in the industry, IR4 verticals as now, I think more than 16 verticals are there. Hmm. The best part is that when you implement those stuff, you gather a lot of data, right? And hmm. this data is what is going to be useful for you in the future. Right. So it's not just like you use a device and then it's a one-off thing, but one right. the, the investment, you collect a lot of information too, which is already... Yeah. Uh, it will be used for your decision making and for you to come up with your own information system in the future. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I mean, if you have noticed that, I mean, we can't ignore China. China is very good in technology. It's growing and it's always bringing a challenging technology in the market. So my that brings to my last question. I mean, it's technology we are talking about. We can't ignore China in that sense. So in Asia, particularly, China has been at the forefront of drone technology. Why do you think so? And how are other economies, you know, faring with them? See, if you if you see in the context of drone technology, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Uh, undeniably, we can we must understand that. China has the workforce, China has the resources to actually produce or manufacture drones massively. Right. I don't see this as a threat. You know? 
I see this as an advantage. You see, drones, and when you talk about drone technology, 20% requires the field application. That means requires flying and so on. The rest of the 80% is for data acquisition and processing. So when you, when you uh, coin the, the, the word as drone technology, right? You know, as, as a technology itself. Meaning they can produce a drone, right? But there are many other things that comes with it. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. They, they are good at what they are doing, producing drones and so on. But other countries are good in terms of programming or in terms of putting a software into it or developing various payloads. Mm-hmm. So I think this is, I think the countries, apart from China, they can complement each other, mm-hmm. right? And share this economy uh, between them, yeah. right? And uh, I think it's, it, it's not, I don't see it as a threat, but I see that we must take a leverage on this, take advantage yeah. of this. Sure. Whereby they can manufacture, so it, you don't do the same thing like what they do, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. You, uh, um, you, you, you should complement that. You should have, um, see what are the elements missing in the drone technology. Right. Can, like certain countries, like the Europe, they produce the payloads like LIDAR and so on. Right. And uh, India, they're good in the data acquisition and processing. Yeah. Whereas China is, they are very much uh, good in terms of producing the hardware for drones. Yeah, yeah. And uh, other countries can take advantage in terms of the skills to use the group. So I would say it's a shared economy. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, of course, it uh, like yeah, if you look at the India's initiative during that space shuttle, sending the space shuttle and, you know, uh, collaborating with the neighborhood was an interesting and impressive angle to see how and the, the prove your point, the, how it impressive and important it was and how it was beneficial across the all the neighborhood in Southeast China. So it was very impressive move and it proves your point, uh, you know, because we have seen in an example at that time. So that brings to me my closing question <laughs> is that I know you've been traveling all over the world and, you know, we discussed and we talked about you've been in Europe and other places. What's your view in Australia? So how do you see SG coming to Australia and, you know, how it can, it can create the impact? My, my affiliation, um, I mean, I'll begin with this. My affiliation with Australia uh, is based on the uh, skill uh, transformation. Yes. Right? Uh, I've worked with many companies in Australia. Right. And I've heard many of their best practices here. See, Australia is closer to Malaysia, mm-hmm. right? And it has good elements of the British and also from the States. Yes. So being just, ne- you can be in Australia in this next couple of hours to the closest point, right? Yeah. And it's, it has, uh, I would say, uh, diversified culture and diversify community there. Right? Yes. So I think it's very much closer to home. Mm-hmm. So especially Perth, right? Yeah. When you come to Perth, you can see many Malaysians are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So being one strategically closer to Malaysia, right? Number two, they have the uh, mixture of culture from various countries. Mm-hmm. And third, they have big land space when it comes to drone technology and so on. That yeah. You can capitalize on that. And they are very much uh, centric towards sustainability, uh, I mean, uh, the, the SDG goals, sustainability uh, and clean energy and so on. I think we can learn a lot from them. Right. In terms of business opportunity, there are vast business opportunities, uh, no doubt, because you can see a lot of nations are going to Australia as well. So I see this big opportunity, it's one of the biggest opportunities that you should capitalize uh, Maybe the next few years, once the borders are open, yeah, yeah, something that we should uh, focus on. Yeah, great. 
good to hear and of course we all are opening waiting for opening borders especially and it's been a while we all love traveling and connecting people thank you so much for your time today we will be looking forward to see you and i would be looking forward and following your journey you know sg has been following i've been following for a while now and i'm sure it will be you know it has a great future and we'll be looking forward to see you in australia thank you so much Thank you. It's a pleasure having me here in this session. Yeah. Um, I hope my views are helpful. Um, basically, um, I'm looking into the views are taken. Yes, it does. I hope you can develop something from that. Yeah, and I'm sure all your details will be given to our description. So if people want to reach out and find out about more about SD, please check out on his website and other social platforms where he, they are quite active. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, and like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already done it. To know more about us, visit www.coprality.global. And also you can find more about Priya Mishra is on priya.sydney.